in the COIA protocol and APS is an international agreement intended to ensure the implementation of Objective 3 of the Convention on Biological Diversity, that is the fair share of benefits arising from the utilization of genetic resources. The goal is to contribute to the conservation and sustainable use of global biodiversity. Since its launch in 2017, the UNDP GEF Global APS project has assisted 23 countries in strengthening their human resources, legal frameworks and institutional capacities to implement the Nakoya Protocol at the national level. Thanks to the full commitment of project countries, the UNDP GEF Global APS Project has supported the creation of national legal frameworks, including the drafting of 23 ABS laws and regulations, seven of which have already been approved by their national authorities. To promote bioprospecting activities, the project helped producing seven strategies, resulting in 39 partnerships between users and providers of genetic resources. The project has supported the draft of 24 biocultural community protocols in 12 countries, 30 APS codes of conduct, and 12 measures to protect traditional knowledge. All these efforts led to the signature of some 215 ABS commercial agreements. To strengthen global cooperation from governments and indigenous people, local communities to researchers, private companies and academia, the UNDP GEF Global APS project launched the first global APS community of practice. This community will provide guidance for the successful implementation of the Nagoya Protocol after project completion, while also maintaining the legacy work and lessons learned during project implementation. With 696 registered members worldwide, the community of practice includes discussion forums, webinars, articles and case studies organized by thematic areas. It also offers professional, legal and businesses services free of charge to both providers and users of genetic resources. And it is the platform to display national, regional and global online events such as the Global ABS Conference 2020, which mobilized key ABS actors from around the world to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Nakoya Protocol. Looking ahead, the objective of this final workshop is to share lessons, challenges and strategies to ensure the sustainability of project outcomes, identify gaps and needs that still need to be addressed for the effective implementation of the protocol, <clears throat> and to address and discuss opportunities to facilitate mutual collaboration at the regional and global levels. While this project is coming to an end, we have built a foundation to ensure its legacy lives on. We have walked a long way together and thanks to your efforts. We have built a fairer and greener global system that can lead us to a more sustainable and equitable development. ABS is work in progress. 
but there are still challenges ahead. But we need to keep the momentum to make APS the rule and not the exception. For our nature and people, let's make APS work for all. Welcome colleagues to this, uh, good morning, good evening. Uh, welcome to the book launch. Just one second, because the video is still playing. That is, just one second, apologies, as I didn't stop the video, and it's playing again. Apologies for that. Good morning colleagues, good evening. Uh, welcome to the book launch uh, of Access to United Resources and Benefit Sharing theory to practice under the Nagoya Protocol, a publication developed by UNDP, funded by the Global Environment Facility, the GEF, under the Global ABS project. This publication displays the outcomes of ABS implementation efforts undertaken by 24 countries and supported by the UNDP GEF Global ABS project and also national ABS projects from Africa, the Arab states, Asia, Central and Eastern Europe, Latin America and the Caribbean, and the Pacific Islands. Before we start, um, I would like to um, initiate a, key, a, a quick message on the protocol for this session. So please take into account that this session will be conducted in English and is being recorded and it will be available uh, through the Global ABS community, the community of practice uh, of the UNDP GEF Global ABS project. All of you are invited to ask questions um, through the Q&A chat box. Uh, participants' questions will be addressed after the panelists' uh, presentations during the Q&A uh, section. Um, to continue the discussions on the topic of this webinar, please visit the Global ABS community and leave your discussion on the forum section. In this case, you can download this publication through the Global ABS community, uh, but you also can check the chat box for the link to directly download the PDF. Um, access to the resources and benefit sharing, theory to practice under the Nagoya Protocol, underscores the importance of genetic resources to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, not only in terms of uh, catalyzers of processes for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity, but also as drivers for their uh, recovery during the post-pandemic times. Today, in this launch event, we are honored to have experts and practitioners from five of the countries involved on, on this publication, from India, uh, Cambodia, Jordan, Samoa, and South Africa, to present and discuss the legal, ecological, economic, and social impacts of their national ABS regimes, along with the scientific innovations developed under the Nagoya Protocol implementation. I would like to thank and to welcome uh, our remarkable speakers for your most appreciated participation in uh, the book and also uh, for being available uh, and interested to participate in this uh, book launch. Um, we will hear from um, colleagues from different countries as I just expressed it. And first of all, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Dr. Santiago Carrizosa who is the UN Global Lead on Access to Genetic Resources and Benefit Sharing at UNDP, who will give the opening remarks uh, of this event. Welcome, Santiago. You have the floor. Oh, thank you, Alejandro. Thank you so much. I am very happy to welcome all of you to the launching of this uh, publication titled Access to Genetic Resources and Benefit Sharing theory to practice under the Nagoya, under the Nagoya Protocol. 
And this book, just like the one titled ABS, is Genetic Resources for Sustainable Development, that we launched in late 2018, provide concrete examples of how can genetic resources be used to improve the livelihoods of local communities by increasing incomes, promoting food security, and contributing to biodiversity conservation, amongst other benefits. This book is also a testament to human ingenuity and innovation. It showcases how genetic resources can be manipulated as a vehicle for sustainable development. And we find a good example of this in the Argentinian chapter of the book, which describes the contribution of genetic resources to the third sustainable development goal regarding good health and well being. This chapter explains how a special kind of antibody found in the bloodstream of the Guanaco can be used as a weapon to fight the virus that causes diarrhea in children. But most importantly, when the COVID 19 pandemic struck, the Argentinian scientists used the project's experience to isolate similar antibodies from the bloodstream of the domestic llama that could be the foundation to develop preventative and therapeutic treatments against the virus, which has killed over 3.4 million people worldwide and caused untold economic damage. Genetic resources are indeed strategic, not only to develop a cure against COVID-19, but also for the post-pandemic green recovery process as Alejandro described, and as is also described in several chapters of this publication. Now, this publication also illustrates the journey taken by 24 countries worldwide to develop national ABS laws and policies, which have been used by users and providers of genetic resources to develop these ABS products in accordance with key principles of the Nagoya Protocol, such as prior informed consent and mutually agreed terms. The chapters of the book are authored by experts and practitioners from governments, research institutions, indigenous peoples, and local communities from these 24 countries that participated in the implementation of ABS projects funded by the Global Environmental Facility and supported by UNDP. Now, this book is also a visual celebration of our biological, genetic, and cultural diversity. You will be taken on a journey around the world, visiting different countries and landscapes, and meeting indigenous peoples and local communities, scientists and policymakers. This book demonstrates that the future for the sustainable use of biological and genetic resources is here. We hope that you enjoy the journey through these countries, their biodiscovery cases and peoples as much as we enjoy working, working with them. Thank you so much. Over to you, Alejandro, thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Santiago, for uh, these opening remarks and contextualizing um, what is going to be the event today and what is the publication about, no? which is actually a journey. No? So let's start the journey and let's start uh, the journey from India. Uh, and we have, uh, we are honored to have Dr. Vinod Mathur, who is the chairperson of the National Biodiversity Authority of India. Thank you so much, Dr. Mathur, for being with us today. You have the floor. Thank you, Alejandro, for providing this opportunity. I would say it's a great moment for us uh, to be present uh, at the launch of uh, the book, which of course I have not seen in my own hands, I was mentioning, but uh, one has to live with things which are done virtually. Uh, why I say this important? Because uh, as we say sometimes in English that uh, we miss the bus, meaning thereby that uh, this is the second time you are bringing out this publication and uh, when you brought the first publication, there was no India in that. 
So when I joined my present position as the chairperson of the National Biodiversity Authority and as somebody responsible for access and benefit sharing, and when you discuss this idea, I immediately said that, look, this time we can't make this mistake. We have to be in, we have to contribute, and we have to be part of this global team. And we have to come forward with an example by which we can say that the excess and benefit sharing is not just in the legal domain, but is actually working. So I realized that and I consulted my colleagues, uh, both in UNDP, India office, and uh, my colleagues in the National Biodiversity Authority. And uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, what is that case that India wants to present? And uh, that is where I must, I'll be very candid in my comments that I realized that uh, while there have been several applications which have been processed by NBA for grant of access to biological resources, uh, collection of the ABS amount, I had uh, to dig out deeply to find out the case where the complete cycle has happened. Meaning thereby that uh, there is a, an application, there is a process, there is an approval, there is a collection of ABS amount, and uh, then comes the process of distribution of that amount and distribution of that amount to the conserver of the resource. And as our colleagues understand that ABS money is not to go into government coffers or government institutions like my authority. Well, a part of the money for administrative purposes can be retained, but a major purpose is twofold, that wherever a biological resource is involved, we need to ensure its conservation. And wherever local communities are involved in its protection, we need to provide that money back to them so that they feel that uh, it is uh, the livelihood support which a particular resource conservation is giving. So I wanted to see this complete story. And I then started working with my colleagues and we were able to find out a story. I mean, now we are saying it is a story because it is published or being published as a book, but there is no fiction. This is real life. So we had a, a case from an Italian company and uh, that company makes uh, lots of things uh, um, in terms of biostimulants, in terms of biofertilizers, in terms of biological products. And they had approached a, a particular province in India, a biodiversity management committee. People were involved, villagers were involved, and they were trying uh, to get samples so that they could extract certain microorganisms and make their product. So we said, yes, it is possible. It is a fit case to us. So we, we granted permissions, they deposited the money, and then came the difficult part, as I was trying to explain, that we had to give back this money to the local communities. And that is where we entered into a dialogue. And I put up a very strict deadline that, look, this is the deadline. We can give a few weeks, but this money has to go in. And I'm very pleased to say that uh, this company, this Italian-based company who entered into an agreement, who worked for its process and product, but at the same time gave uh, money for the people where it was due, and we have been able to distribute this money. So what my point is that today, if you look at the ABS world, there are many players, but industry, unfortunately, is not a big player. And that is what is a major learning from this project of yours that we need to get these people in. The buy-in for the industry is very important. And uh, if you recall what we said yesterday, we also had a meeting of your steering committee. You talked about a phase two of the project. We are looking at it. That, And I'm sure this question is very relevant to all my colleagues. How do we incentivize the ABS process? How do we make the industry feel happy. 
See, right now, everybody comes and tells me that, Dr. Mathur, uh, you are trying to impose a tax on us. And uh, we don't want to pay tax. We have paid tax to the government. And I am hard to explain that I am not charging a tax. I am talking of resource conservation. So basically, the point I'm making is that there is a lot of understanding gap. We need to go back and say that if you become part of the ABS process, this is the reputational advantage you will get. And everybody understands uh, a certification process. Everybody understands a logo or an emblem. And we are now working with uh, our partners in the country to work out a mechanism where if I am compliant for ABS, I follow the process of law, but I go beyond that. And that is where most of us, I'm sure, are drinking coffee, which we say is a green coffee, not because it comes from a green plant, but it follows a process which makes it comfortable that there have been a proper uh, utilization of the resource. There have been all due processes which have been followed. So I will stop here uh, and say that we are almost uh, on the finalization of the scheme. And uh, this project was very uh, kind. And Alejandro, you were very kind uh, that you connected us with Costa Rican counterparts. And Costa Rica, I must say with pride that perhaps is the only country as of now, which is looking in similar lines. So India wants to follow that footstep. Our schemes may be different. Our situations may be different. But uh, we would like to partner with all of you to say that can we look at this process uh, in a new, with a new lens and a little what we say as an out of box approach. So we are nearly there. We need a few more months of work, but I'm sure that uh, in a few months time, we should be able to say that this is what India has been able to do in further upscaling the ABS process. I will stop here, Alejandro. If you have a secondary question of a colleagues, you may please come in. Thank you so much, Dr. Mahfoud. I think you, you have brought many things to the, to the table, no? which are important. And I'm sure that colleagues will have different questions. I invite them to uh, write and send their questions through the Q&A uh, chat box. Um, but it's true that uh, the first important thing that we uh, have done with this second publication under the Global ABS project is to correct a very strange situation, no? that India, one of the lead countries on ABS, was not included no? in the previous uh, publication, and we were missing you desperately. So actually, we did this because of you. We were missing you too much, uh, Dr. Mathur, and we were missing too much India. It's fantastic to, to have you back, and, and I think uh, we have been extremely lucky uh, to, to have you on board uh, with your leadership. You are a true champion on ABS and the, the project, not only at the national level in India, but I think the, the, the examples you, you have uh, indicated of the community of practice, you know, the collaboration with other countries, Costa Rica on similar issues, is exactly what is the, the global ABS community is about. No? That kind of direct informal exchange uh, to move uh, forward, no? different uh, approaches, different tools. No? So we are delighted to see that uh, approach the need to involve uh, private sector is a crucial need that we need to tackle um, and to identify the tools that can uh, make this attractive for them, for, for private sector, is, is crucial. No? And if we move into a second phase, definitely that has to be an objective of the, of the second phase of the, of the project. And anticipating this, tomorrow we are going to present no, a pilot project on blockchain as an innovative tool for ABS also, no, to check whether that kind of tools can uh, motivate, can incentivize uh, private sector to, to be more active. No? And of course, the connection with sustainable development, no? the clear connection with sustainable development. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mathur, for this um, initial round of uh, comments regarding the chapter in India. How was the process to, to obtain that, uh, that very nice uh, chapter in the book? Um, 
And now I would like to move, uh, continue our trip um, to Cambodia. Our colleagues in Cambodia, unfortunately, um, due to the time difference, could not uh, join us uh, live. But we are going to hear from Dr. Somali Chan, who is the Under Secretary of State at the Ministry of Environment of Cambodia and ABS National uh, Focal Point. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. First, I would like to take this opportunity to thank to UNDP GF Global ABS Project for organizing this event and inviting me to share our country experience on the implementation of Nagoya Protocol. Today, I would like to share information on the status of implementation of Nagoya Protocol in Cambodia and provide some remarkable outcome from the implementation of Nagoya Protocol as well as the National ABS Project implementation. I will also address some view and present a key benefit from the implementation. I will highlight a key challenge at the end of my presentation. Now let me move to the status of Nagoya Protocol implementation in Cambodia. We ratified this protocol on 19 January 2015 and become a party in three months later on 19 April 2015. To fulfill our obligation as a party, Cambodia has designated national focal point and competent national authority to the Secretariat of the Convention. We also established necessary body to implementation of the protocol, such as steering committee, technical working group on ABS, that composed from all relevant institutions and stakeholders, including private sector and indigenous and local community representatives. Unfortunately, our ABS framework and legislation is still in draft and under development. Mm -hmm. The procedure for access genetic resource has been built in case basics, and ABS clearing how for sharing information is under development, as well as the checkpoint for tracking our resources is in the process. During the implementation, we take note the five major impacts, including existing legislation related to ABS, to K associated with genetic resources, capacity building, gender and ABS, institutional arrangement and partnership. Based on our national ABS project implementation, we review existing legislation and take note there are three national regulations are most relevant to the Nagoya Protocol on ABS. The law on management of pharmaceutical that endorsed in 1996, the protective area law in 2018 that have regulated and monitored plants Y species, cross breeding of Y species, and recognize access to traditional use, local custom, and sharing the benefit and religion of the indigenous and local community. The National Forest Program and Policy also regulate forest and non timber forest product consuming and harvesting with sustainability. Regarding to the TK associated with genetic resources, we recognize that the customary use of genetic resource associated with traditional knowledge for daily livelihood and uh, disease uh, treatment has existed since the Khmer Empire. Plant and animal component has been used for traditional medicine by ancient people to cure all the common illness. Based on data from Ministry of Health, at least 760 species are identified as medicinal plant and has been used at the present. We also take note that the healer versus are the primary health care for local people who are living in the remote area 
that have difficulty to access health service from the center. And traditional medicine and healing methods are still popular and functioning until now. Unfortunately, we do realize that capacity of institutions, including National for COP1 and competent national authority are limited to effective implementation of the Navigant Protocol. More importantly, capacity of indigenous and local community to understand the context of the Navigant Protocol and their ability to participate in the peak and mud process are very behind. We learn from the process that women's role in ABS process is very significant to ensure the effective implementation of the protocol. It is because of the women is a driving force to enabling ABS activity. She can better build partnership and negotiate for the peak and mud agreements. She play a significant role as a family teacher because she is the one that stay close with the children. She is always harmonizing with nature and daily use of genetic resources. As you may know, ABS is a cross-cutting issue. There is a need for strong cooperation and collaboration with all relevant stakeholders including academia, private sector, and even civil society. Moreover, institutional arrangement is needed and enhanced cooperation among responsible institutions also recommended. Now let me move to the benefit from the implementation of both protocol and national ABS project. We talk not five significant benefit that we receive from the implementation. The biodiversity conservation, nature-based solutions, scientific research development, green economy strategy, and social economic development. Article 1 of the protocol clearly identifies the objective of the protocol in which institution, in, in which contribution the biodiversity conservation and sustainable use of genetic resources. By implementation of the protocol, there is direct and indirect contribution, the species diversity conservation, sustainable use of genetic resources, and rehabilitate ecosystem and natural habitat through the benefit sharing and regulation as defined in the peak and mud process. As process ABS process also help conserve food variety, food security, and food safety, especially for the local community who are depend on natural resources. Cambodia is considering the prioritizing on conserve alternative uh, genetic diversity for sustainable consuming, especially by local farmers. Right now, Part of National ABS Project, the Research and Conservation Center has been established to enhance scientific research on species and genetic conservation of plant and animal education and livelihood development. We are in the process to experiment on tissue culture of orchid and prepare organic and vanilla farm as well as planning for promoting by our prospecting, especially gene bank, in the near future. The government policy is promote green development by taking into account on implementation of the green growth strategy, economic innovation, agro industry development program, green productivity, the circular economy. So, ABS program is recommended to integrate into the green development strategy as well. Social economic uh, development is remaining important for the country development. The benefit sharing from the access and utilization of genetic resources could help Cambodia economic grow, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Therefore, the government have incorrect for local people 
to increase their productivity and promote local farmer production. Although there are challenges for effective implementation of the Naria Protocol, the most critical challenge is capacity to develop a comprehensive national ABS legislation and its implementation. Due to national ABS legislation is under development within national ABS project framework, Cambodia is unable to get benefit from the user who are accessing and utilization of our genetic resources. So there is a need for uh, develop a very uh, uh, comprehensive uh, framework and uh, ABS legislation as soon as possible. And uh, we uh, hope that uh, uh, the ABS uh, project, the national ABS project, will uh, help Cambodia to solve out uh, this uh, challenge. Thank you uh, for your listening, and uh, I wish uh, you all with a very fruitful event and stay safe. Thank you so much to Dr. Somali Chan, Under Secretary of State uh, of the Ministry of Environment uh, in Cambodia, uh, who has uh, uh, provided us several information regarding the status of ABS in Cambodia um, and the importance uh, of the efforts to mainstream no? ABS into other uh, sectoral policies, uh, taking into account that ABS is a very horizontal, no, transversal uh, tool. I would like to highlight that um, we have a global EBS project, although Cambodia is not part of the global EBS project. Um, we have a very close uh, relationship with, with Cambodia because they host uh, a regional meeting of the community of practice, actually the, the first official, official uh, meeting of uh, community of practice um, in October 2018, where we gathered all the colleagues uh, from Asia with the general support from uh, South Korea and the uh, fantastic support from our colleagues uh, from UNDP uh, Bangkok uh, Regional Hub. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Somali. You are also a true champion on, on ABS. You have been working for many years on the topic and we can see how the country is uh, evolving no? and implementing this uh, policy with different challenges, no? like many others uh, have already expressed uh, to approve the, the ABS legislation. It's always complex, but uh, it's important not to wait just for that, but to have all the measures, even provisional measures no? in place in order to uh, address and, and create uh, opportunities and showcase no? how this works. Fantastic. Uh, so after this um, stop in Cambodia, in a tropical, tropical country, we moved to a more uh, arid, uh, arid uh, state uh, from the Arab countries. We moved to Jordan on this trip. And in this case, we have Dr. Mustafa al the fact who is the director of programs at the Royal Botanical Garden in Jordan. Dr. Musafa, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, thank you, Alejandro. Um, uh, this is uh, actually my honor to participate in, in, in this event, and I, I want to thank uh, all of uh, the project team that participated in uh, this project and our colleague. Also, please allow me to thank the. Uh, our colleague that uh, uh, prepare and organize this uh, this uh, event. Um, at first, uh, you know, Jordan uh, uh, ratified the ABS Nidoya uh, Protocol in 2014, and since that, it's uh, with different government organization and NGOs working together, and this is the. Uh, this work uh, by the end is supported through the uh, UNDB ABS uh, project. Just to give you um, 
general information about the Jordan. It's, uh, the Jordan is relatively very, uh, you know, small uh, geographical area. Uh, it's just like 90,000 square kilometers. Uh, we have uh, a, a good, uh, you know, biodiversity uh, in, in, in the country. We have around 2,531 vascular plants, 78 mammals, and uh, uh, around 425 uh, bears. Also, we have uh, just only one uh, side of the country that is uh, towards the Red Sea. We And we have like uh, more than 1,000 uh, species. Uh, the rich of uh, biodiversity is uh, uh, here in, in Jordan because of the different biogeographical zone that we have. Uh, we have Mediterranean and iran turanian and the biggest, which is Saharo Arabia, which is uh, more than 80% of, of the country. And also we have the Sudanese Bintrae. Uh, the forest uh, cover is uh, one percent of, of uh, the total area of uh, Jordan, and uh, Jordan is recognized as uh, part of the global crescent of land biodiversity, which is the origin of that wild uh, relative. It's through our, uh, you know, effort to get the national framework on the ABS. Uh, actually, we work uh, in a close with the Ministry of Environment, which is the focal point of the ABS. Uh, for the past three years, which is uh, we have a series of consultation sessions, uh, capacity building uh, workshops, and also consultation with the different like stakeholders, local communities, the research institutes. Uh, government agencies, uh, legal parties. All these, you know, we consult uh, together to get the preliminary endorse uh, of uh, the ABS from the Ministry of Environment. Then after that, uh, this uh, bylaw, it's go uh, to the, you know, and the process of national uh, process, uh, legislation process. Till that we get, you know, the final endorsement of the BAB as uh, uh, protocol at the national level or by law uh, by the cabinet. Uh, this is it was like uh, two months ago. Uh, this is a good, you know, uh, achievement here uh, in terms of uh, national legislation, in terms of uh, you know. Um, Conserving, you know, our biodiversity and encouraging the local community participation and conserving and sustaining the genetic resources in, in, in Jordan. Uh, of course, this is uh, a big, you know, step in, in, in uh, on national legislation related to the biodiversity and conservation. And this is, you know, it will be, you know, continuous uh, review and update on, on this file. Uh, in parallel to that, uh, through our journey with the traditional knowledge, uh, we uh, work, uh, you know, with different stakeholders and with the UNDB to, to comment uh, uh, our local knowledge and uses of, of uh, genetic resources related to the, uh, gen uh, you know, ABS. And we use a multiple methodology. We use the direct interview, focus group, and uh, you know, recording, and uh, you know, filming and videos, and uh, taking you know, photograph to document the uses of, of uh, different genetic resources. The interviews that we, we made uh, more than 300 uh, local people and key uh, stakeholders from the local community. Also, we uh, implement around uh, six focus group, uh, each uh, two focus group in, in, in one biogeographical zone. Uh, we consider um, our, you know, sampling and data collection on the age group and the gender equity. And uh, to be honest, we, we have like a special focus on 
the twin girls, especially for the ladies, that uh, they have a big, you know, um, uh, very high information related to the medicinal plant and uh, food or, uh, you know, plant. Um, through, you know, this uh, study and documentation that we uh, identified, uh, around 220 plant species were reported and around like 70% of these plants, uh, uh, they, they, they use it for uh, medicinal purposes, uh, plus uh, food purposes. Uh, around like 10 to 20% is uh, used for a cosmetic and uh, also 71 mammals species were recorded, including the insects, they have like influence on, on uh, you know, the uses of uh, food, and uh, part of them is used for the medicinal purpose. 23 marine species were recorded. This is in, in Justin Jordan in Gulf of Agaba, where we have the Red Sea. Uh, and uh, to be honest, we, 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 we think that uh, a lot of, uh, more than this number of species is it should be documented uh, because we have more than 1,000 uh, fish species in that area and uh, more than 250 coral species uh, found in the Gulf of Agam. Um, this is, you know, uh, part of this uh, work. This is a very, you know, good to be identified, especially because this study, um, maybe this is the first study that, uh, you know, targets the whole uh, local community of, of uh, Jordan. Many of uh, other studies that target part of the geographic uh, region in, in Jordan and document all these things. Uh, we engaging uh, our uh, output through the uh, previous study, which is, you know, together uh, form, uh, uh, I think, in my opinion, a very rich, uh, you know, uh, documentation of, of our uh, genetic resources. All this uh, information is uploaded uh, on the clearinghouse mechanism, which is available mm -hmm. for everybody. Uh, and, and actually, you know, our journey, it's uh, in, in the beginning. And uh, as I said, this is the first. And uh, we, we should work together uh, here in Jordan and maybe with other partners outside the Jordan to how to um, enhance the way forward to support the implementation of ABS by law. Um, uh, and this is, you know, a time to um, mainstream this, uh, uh, say, you know, ratified, you know, bylaws uh, with the private sector and the government agency in a wider and in a business model uh, and a way for uh, sustainability and conservation. Um, through so our uh, working with local knowledge, uh, there is a need to build a trustful, valid, reliable internet website that will provide and preserve our uh, heritage uh, for the, the, the local knowledge. Uh, through our work with the local communities, uh, we find that many, many uh, websites, and uh, especially uh, because now the social media, it's uh, you know, very, very popular here. And they, they use this site, uh, which is part of them is unreliable and valid uh, to get the information from. Uh, of course, there is a need to further documentation of biological resources uses. And this is, you know, to make more focus uh, and make more interviews and, to, you know, contact with the uh, secret uh, holder of the local knowledge to, uh, you know, um, complement what uh, we, we, we get through the baseline of study. Uh, also, it's necessary to implement the uh, ABS, the national ABS by law, and to promote it, it uh, to promote our biological resources based on scientific evidences, which is could be, you know, attractive for the private sector to participate and engage in this process. Um, uh, finally, I want to thank all of uh, our colleagues, all of the project team that support uh, 
us to to reach this uh, you know uh, level of uh, you know uh, building you know the ABS and mainstreaming the BS, ABS on the uh, national level. Thank you and uh, thank you for you all. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dr. Mustafa. Um, it's incredible. Congratulations, because it's incredible all the work that has been conducted no, in uh, Jordan. It's starting almost from scratch no, in the, um, with, with the support of the, of the project and, and your leadership. No? We can see that um, you have done a lot of work uh, and, and a lot of research. You have worked very close with the communities, which is extremely important. And we have to congratulate you because you managed to approve very recently the ABS by law, which is a very important no, uh, instrument to continue the work no, uh, and not to be worried about the, the legal part, but just uh, focus on, on implementation. If you allow me, I would like also to highlight that you are very lucky in the sense that you have a true champion no, uh, within your country who is um, Her Royal Highness uh, Princess Basma bin Ali. And I would like to connect um, with a point that made uh, Dr. Mathur at the beginning. No? Um, I remember that we were having a workshop uh, discussing a final round of discussions on the ABS by law, different articles. And of course, when you have a princess in the room, you expect that the discussion maybe is going to be moderated or low, or it's going to be difficult to go into the substance, right? And I was shocked because I was in that meeting, I was in that uh, workshop, that the first question came directly from Her Royal Highness, no? Um, and her first comment was, well, Article 9 is saying that some funds are going to be transferred to the Ministry of Environment and benefits should be transferred to local communities this should not go to the national budget, but this should be transferred directly to the communities. Huh? A point that was made uh, before uh, by Dr. Mathur and that, that opened completely uh, a wild conversation no, on the purpose of ABS and a very lively discussion during that uh, workshop. So no shy at all. And she was really pointed out the, the right direction no, on the instruments. Um, um, so, Musafa, uh, it was a pleasure to, to have you in the in the team, in the project, and it was great to be partnering with the Royal Botanical Garden, as you have been um, extremely uh, efficient and active no? during the, the, the entire project, and, and um, we can see that in the results that you have uh, shared with us. No? I'm sure we will have different questions. Also, to Dr. Mathur, just let you know that um, our colleague from Costa Rica, uh, Melania Muñoz, has uh, raised uh, her, her, her hand and um, we will give her the floor, okay, just to validate or to add to what you said on the ABS label. Uh, towards the end, after all the panelists uh, intervene, we will, we will go through the uh, participants that want to also intervene. Um, reminder to all the participants, please uh, send and write your questions through the Q&A uh, chat box. Don't use the normal chat box, use the uh, questions and answers uh, specific chat box, okay? And from um, Jordan, Ari Jordan, we move to an island, uh, Paradise Island in the, in the Pacific. And we are going to play a short video from the, um, just one second, apologies. One short video from Ms. Uh, Frances Reupena, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment of uh, Samoa, who couldn't be presenting live today due to the time difference uh, in their countries but who have kindly uh, shared their valuable testimonies through a video that will be played right away.
Talo falawa and greetings to you all. Samo acknowledges with much appreciation the invitation extended to our government by the UNDB GEF Global ABS project to be part of this milestone celebration of the access and benefit sharing project. We congratulate you on today's book launch on ABS Theory to Practice, which marks the successful completion of the ABS project journey throughout the various regions, in particular the selected countries across the world. The publication documents practical experiences and lessons learned on ABS development and implementation within our own respected countries. Samoa is fortunate to be one of the few Pacific Island countries to benefit from this UNDP GEF Global ABS project. And on behalf of our government, I am pleased to present national achievements under the ABS project. These include the development of Samoa's national access and benefit sharing legal framework, the development of the draft genetic resources and associated judicial knowledge management bill, development of biocultural community protocols for the two conservation-led efforts from villages of Faliasi'ila and Aopu to enhance community-based management and conservation of their respective key biodiversity areas and safeguard our genetic resources and equally important the traditional knowledge associated with the use of genetic resources. I am pleased to note extensive consultations and active engagement with the communities led to the successful development and ownership of these biocultural community protocols. We are also happy to note the development of Samoa's national ABS clearinghouse mechanism and is now in use to provide better management of ABS processes in terms of data, information and knowledge management. Development of the biodiscovery analysis report for Samoa has enabled us to document our experiences on ABS-related research development, in particular, our ABS research biodiscovery case study that Samoa was fortunate to present at the COP14 of the CBD that was held in Egypt 2018. The development of Samoa's national guidelines on access and use of judicial knowledge associated with genetic resources in both English and Samoan. In addition, I'm also pleased to note that the Scientific and Research Organization of Samoa has officially launched its Biodiscovery Center, which is a first for Samoa and which will allow us to undertake biomedical and pharmaceutical research. We welcome the advancement of local research with the opportunity to enhance the capacity of our local scientific and research organization. We take this opportunity to thank our partners under the ABS project. We have achieved much under the project, but more needs to be done. There needs to be ongoing awareness to keep people informed, but importantly for ourselves to listen to and learn from the people, their views, their knowledge, and skills, their needs and their specific challenges, and their vision to ensure our plans, systems, and processes are responsive to community needs and specific contexts. We need to continually build the capacity of our local scientists, have access to technological resources to enhance our scientific organization. We need to have genuine partnerships with international research organizations so we have access to the latest and most relevant research findings. We need to strengthen the capacity of the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment to implement fully the ABS legal framework. Ladies and gentlemen, today's book launch is a testament of our collective efforts to persevere and ensure that we do not lose sight of the importance of continuing with our global efforts, our regional efforts, our national and local efforts to safeguard our environment, 
our biological resources that we all depend on. We thank you for your support and look forward to continuing our partnership. Congratulations once again on the book launch. Best wishes and the highest of regards from Samoa. Soifua. Thank you so much uh, to Ms. Frances Raupena, uh, who is the CEO of the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment of Samoa for being uh, with us uh, in this book launch uh, through this recorded video. If you have any questions either to Cambodia, Samoa, please uh, feel free to write your questions also in the Q&A chat box and we will uh, ensure that the person can receive the question and also answer in the community of practice, okay? So, last but not least at all in our trip, uh, in this journey throughout the world, we have uh, South Africa, and in this case, we have Mr. Colombi Matibe, who is the Chief Director of Biodiversity Economy and Sustainable Use at the Department of Environmental Affairs of South Africa. Mr. Colombi, Thank you for being with us. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Program Director. Program Director, UNDP delegates, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Geographically, South Africa occupies the southern tip of our continent, African continent. And although our country equates to 2% of the world in terms of size, 7% of the world reptiles, 10% of the world plants, and 15% of the world marine species are found in this country. I'm very grateful to introduce South Africa's bioprospecting case study on a major breakthrough in the implementation of the Nagoya Protocol using rooibos species and its associated traditional knowledge, including the development of biocultural community protocol. I would like to start by expressing my gratitude to our UNDP and GEF partners for the financial support provided through the UNDP GEF Global ABS project to strengthen implementation of the growing ABS program in South Africa. I really want our partners to know that the overall project output was highly impactful. I also want to extend my appreciation to my team for their continuing hard work in this space, but specifically also to uh, appreciate the Koi and Sen communities and the rooibos industry for reaching such a historic agreement in our country. As you might be aware, South Africa is regarded as one of the mega bi biological diverse country in the world. We have an entire Cape Floral Kingdom that is endemic to South Africa. As I mentioned earlier on, this rich biological diversity and endemism presents unique opportunities for conservation, for sustainable use, and benefit sharing. These biological and cultural resources underpin a large proportion of the biodiversity economy and many rural and urban people are directly dependent on them for employment, for food, for shelter, medicine, and spiritual well being. Furthermore, our rich biological biodiversity forms the basis for bioprospecting and bio trade, and thus contributing to economic growth, commercial research, and development that underpins the well being of the entire society. In fact, you might be interested to know that the biodiversity economy of South Africa is currently sustaining 418,000 jobs, majority of which are located in the far-flung rural areas of our, our beautiful land. Program Director, South Africa was requested to share some of its remarkable achievements in the national implementation of the Nagoya Protocol in the publication. In this regard, our country has developed the National Biodiversity Economy Strategy the NBES, as a country's blueprint for sustaining growth of both the wildlife, bio-trade, and bio-prospecting industries. 
These strategies create, created enabling opportunities for advancing the three objectives of the Convention on Biological Diversity, namely conservation, sustainable use, and promoting fair and access, fair access and equitable sharing of benefits from the use of genetic resources and associated traditional knowledge. This strategy was contextualized to operationalize the National Biodiversity Law, which is the National Environmental Management and Biodiversity Act, which was enacted in 2004, which domesticated the CBD objectives and its protocol. Program director, we went further and also developed specific national regulations for bioprospecting, access and benefit sharing. This strengthened our commitment to the Nagoya Protocol on ABS. Our institutional and administrative processes governed by, by the said legislation binds users of genetic resources and associated traditional knowledge to seek mandatory permits and approval of negotiated and concluded benefit sharing agreements from government. Coming to the specific details of the South African case study in the publication, allow me to indicate that the Aspalathus linearis, commonly known as rooibos in South Africa and over the, all over the world, is one of the most recognizable plants found within the Cape Floral Kingdom and mostly used in the biodiversity economy, particularly for biotrade and bioprospecting. This species is endemic to South Africa and has limited geographical range in the Western and Northern Cape provinces of the country. The plant is known to have been used by the Khoi and Sen communities for millennia. The traditional use of rooibos as a beverage is still a vibrant culture in South Africa and has a recognizable international profile. And it's also seen as a proudly South African product and brand by the world at large. Most of us are familiar with rooibos being consumed as tea, but it is also has interlinking value added properties into products in the cosmetics and personal care industries, flavor as well as food industries and pharmaceutical industries. However, such recognition cannot exist without acknowledging the contribution of traditional knowledge to the commercial utilization of rooibos. Hence, South Africa rooibos industry has acknowledged the role of traditional knowledge of the Khoi and Sen in the development of medicinal, cosmetic, beverage, and related use of the rooibos species through a procedurally fair and equitable negotiations a process and concluding of a, an industry-wide benefit sharing agreement. These negotiations were facilitated by government and the final agreement was duly approved and launched by the Minister of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment on the 1st of November, 2019. The government of South Africa feels privileged that this initiative is the first of its kind in the history of implementing its national ABS regulations in the country and this benefit sharing agreement ensures that members of the Khoi and Sen communities benefit in, form, in a form of annual payment of 1.5% of the rooibos industry from the commercialization of rooibos, while at the same time acknowledging the owners of traditional knowledge regarding the use of rooibos through their bulk biocultural community protocol. This approach aligns with the objectives of government's biodiversity economy strategy, which promote transformation, sustainability, uh, and economic contribution from the use of biological resources in advancing development and also in addressing the triple challenges of poverty, unemployment, inequality, especially in the far-flung rural parts of our country. And in conclusion, program director, government's efforts to strengthen regulatory institutional and administrative processes are ongoing in South Africa. Hence, our national ABS regulation tools are presently being reviewed to ensure that they meet the requirements of a dynamic and evolving ABS environment. I hope that the experience shared in this publication 
will provide lessons needed to curb the exploitation of our indigenous peoples and local communities who are the custodians of the biodiversity and traditional knowledge associated with genetic resource. Thank you, Prodent Director. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mativi. Mativi, sorry, Chief uh, Director of Biodiversity Economy and Sustainable Use at the Department of Environmental Affairs of, of South Africa. And congratulations, because as you rightly pointed out, uh, I'm sure it was not easy to, to reach that agreement, no? which is a milestone for you. Uh, in a particular sector that is quite uh, difficult no? to, to put together uh, with all the producers and the users no? uh, to come to, to this agreement. So congratulations uh, for that. Um, before going to the Q&A uh, section, I don't know if the panelists would like to ask or to comment uh, any question to each other before we uh, move to all the questions that we have in the chat. I um, threaten uh, a colleague, Melania, who raised her hand and she disappeared. Uh, so I scare her. I hope she come back and she can also participate in the discussion. But it's true that um, different colleagues have different uh, commitments no, during these busy weeks. So I would like to open the floor to all the colleagues in the panel. If you want to make any comment, I should start with you, Santiago. You want to make any uh, comment or question or remark to any of our panelists? Thank you, Alejandro. Um, perhaps just to, to, to break the ice, uh, I would like to refer to uh, one of the questions from uh, Firdos Ogun. He says, uh, you know, to all presenters, what is the most difficult step or process when initiating and implementing ABS? This is a very broad question, a very difficult one. Uh, there are many, many challenges, you know, in this process. Um, but I, I, I would like to think about two, two main challenges that I'm sure um, my fellow panelists uh, would agree with. The first one is perhaps to develop a, a truly participatory and bottom-up process mm -hmm. involving all stakeholders, indigenous peoples and local communities, private sector, uh, research institutions that are engaged in the design and development of national ABS frameworks. This is a, a, truly a challenge, you know, to get the, the buy-in of all of these sectors and to, to make them agree into one comprehensive national ABS law or policy. And perhaps the second challenge is, once this policy is in place, how can we truly involve the, the private sector so that we manage to identify those opportunities for facilitating the use of genetic resources for the development of products. And these opportunities vary greatly depending on the industry or the sector that is using these genetic resources. Uh, if it's a pharmaceutical sector, cosmetics, agricultural, horticultural industries, then the opportunities are going to change. But in this context, I think it is also very important to manage to convince the government that they should be a true partner to these initiatives with the private sector and perceive this as a great opportunity, not only to further scientific development in the country by linking these bioprospecting initiatives to uh, uh, national uh, science and uh, and, uh, and research opportunities, but also by realizing, you know, that we are in the middle of a pandemic and genetic resources must be used as a vehicle to recover for a green recovery, recovery during this, this time of the pandemic and after. And I'll, I'll summarize this in those two. I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you so much. Uh... 
Santiago, uh, Mustafa, uh, Mr. Corombi uh, or Dr. Mathur, you would like to add something to this question? What is the most difficult uh, initial steps in the implementation of uh, ABS? Okay, can I, uh, Alejandro? Please go ahead, Dr. Mustafa. <clears throat> I think, in my opinion, the, the first step that um, it's, uh, it's very important to have uh, the dedication to um, mainstreaming, you know, the ABS bylaw through your national legislation. This is, a, is a, like a not very short uh, process. It's a very long process. And uh, you should uh, be patent and um, have a dedication to continue. Um, also to get the political support for uh, this, uh, you know, uh, initiative. It's very important to, to have like a political support from the government, from the leaders on biodiversity and conservation, and also the scientific uh, leaders and researchers. Um, in my opinion, the second thing is that it's uh, how to manage to get uh, and to make the attractive uh, benefit for different stakeholders. Uh, and uh, we're talking here about mainly the private sector, the private company and investor, uh, and uh, you know, uh, also the local community and how to make this uh, concept and initiative be understood very well from the local community to be participated in. Uh, and uh, the third party is the government to be able to recognize that this uh, process is, is not the uh, kind of uh, ownership uh, uh, over the genetic resources itself. It's a kind of uh, participatory benefit uh, and uh, benefit sharing for different parties. Uh, the government, the private sector, and the local community. And to make the, uh, the prospective change uh, not to direct benefit as a money, uh, to shift this uh, uh, benefit through the sustainable conservation of uh, the genetic resource. Thank you. Thank you, Mustafa. Definitely, you need to invest, you know, invest time, invest efforts, as you mentioned, at all levels, you know, because it's not something that is going to be accepted in a straightforward manner, but you will need to uh, identify uh, key persons and possibly even champions no? at different levels. And, and it's crucial, and we have detected that as well, that um, we need uh, political support no? to, to make those final steps. Otherwise, it would be very difficult if you have done a, a fantastic uh, technical uh, work uh, if there is no connection and there is no leadership at that level to make uh, the, the legal instrument to go through, it would be very difficult now to make it. Um, Mr. Colombi, do you want to add on these, on the difficulties uh, to, to implement uh, ABS uh, policies and ABS uh, in general? Thank you. Thank you very much, Program Director. <clears throat> I think the First point I just want to emphasize, which has alluded earlier on by my colleague, is patience. It took us nine years to negotiate this agreement, to make sure that the communities, uh, together with the industries, were in one accord in terms of this agreement. So we had to invest a lot of time but also resources, because it also involved that we do, we do and that undertake an independent study to verify scientifically the authenticity of the traditional knowledge uh, 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 holders of this product. So, 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 so that's why it is important that in this process, one of the things we have to do is to make sure that where one be 
is patient and one is focused and one dedicate resources. But I think the other very critical element is the, is the uh, legislative instrument. Because in undertaking this work, uh, you want to make sure and give certainty to the industry, but also to, 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 the, the, to the resource provider, which is the community, that the kind of exercise we are undertaking is actually happening within the confines of our law, both domestically and of course, within the framework of the Nagoya Protocol. That assurance we were able to give to uh, the parties upfront, because as you might have heard, we ratified uh, 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 the Nagoya Protocol in 2013, but uh, we, we had already domesticated uh, uh, the protocol as early um, uh, as earlier than that, to make sure that we are able to, to, to have that uh, legislative uh, certainty in place. So, so, so by and large, it is possible, but it requires uh, that kind of commitment and uh, also inclusivity. Uh, along the way, there are parties who might want to know why are we left behind? You need to bring them on board and also be patient with them and explain thoroughly and fluently the, 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 the significance of the process. Thank you, Program Director. Thank you so much. And, and I think you were, uh, with your answer, you were also addressing another question that is in the, in the Q&A uh, chat box related to whether the legislation, legal uh, measures are the only no, way to uh, negotiate or to their sole uh, means to address ABS. And you have clearly indicated that it's an important instrument, it's necessary, but it's not the only one. I mean, you have invested uh, nine years, uh, even with the legislation, with uh, an ABS by law uh, in place, and even when you have an instrument, agreements don't uh, come no, from, from heaven directly no, to earth uh, automatically, but you need, it's a long process no, of building trust uh, between uh, providers, users. Um, it's, it's a process that requires uh, technical issues that are difficult, as you mentioned, uh, regarding traditional knowledge, no, very sensitive uh, in those countries, for those communities. No? So definitely, Dr. Mustafa, joining with this question and this point on the legal measures, you have recently approved um, the ABS by law, but before, did you manage to have agreements with other, to access unit resources in, in um, Jordan, or that was not possible due to the lack of uh, this ABS by law? I, um, <clears throat> in my opinion, I think, uh, uh, that before the, uh, you know, uh, approved of the national bylaw, it uh, was before that, that um, like, you know, um, uh, it's based on the, the, the opinion and agreed in general between, you know, the private uh, company and the local community uh, themselves. But it's not on legal, you know, uh, organized uh, process. Uh, nowadays, it's, uh, it's very clear for a different party how to involve and to get through this process, which is make it uh, very, very clear and, uh, you know, take in consideration the right of, uh, of uh, different parties. Um, uh, according to our experience, maybe before the um, uh, ratified the ABS uh, uh, protocol. It, uh, I think this is kind of uh, a mutual agreement between different party, and it's maybe it's not very uh, like uh, informal recognition of this uh, process. Uh, but for uh, for now, it's uh, really it's very you know important to to go through this. And part of our challenge uh, and. and, and and during this time is that to implement and the strength, you know, the uh, ABS, uh, national ABS bylaw uh, through different parties. And uh, to be honest, in our, uh, you know, like last meeting, 
even many organization it's uh, now it's ready to adopt this uh, internal legislation and law which, which is very you know important for us to, to be in, on the same uh, level and in the same direction uh, together thank you Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mustafa. So as you rightly pointed out, it's possible to have some voluntary agreements but um, are going to be more difficult to, to, to implement, no? In particular, if uh, some things go wrong. So you are going to depend no, on the interest um, and, and trust no, that can build uh, between the, the different parties. So it is possible to have voluntary agreements uh, even before having ABS legislation, but of course it's going to be more difficult and the process is not going to be um, that standardized. Dr. Mathur, please. Uh, thank you, Alendra. I will carry this uh, discussion a little further. Uh, see, having the law is the first step. That is uh, That goes without saying that unless we have a a legal law for uh, access and benefit sharing, things cannot move. But the second point is that even if you have the law, can you achieve everything? Now comes two more things. First, I would say the interpretation of the law. See, the law is made by lawyers, but it is interpreted by everyone, including people like you and me. So there could be differences in interpretation and therefore it could lead to certain complications in realizing the true benefits of ABS. And the second part is with respect to implementation. Again, you and I are not the only agencies which are implementing. Implementation is being done by many other agencies and in a country like India, we have the state biological diversity boards, they do it. So they also have their own issues with respect to implementation. So interpretation remains an issue, implementation remains an issue. And therefore that leads us to another thing that how do we solve it? And then comes the question of uh, capacity building creation of learning resources. Because if you want to conduct a capacity building program, you must have learning resources, which explain in simple terms that uh, this is the correct interpretation and this is how it needs to be implementation. So the point is that we are dealing with a very difficult subject. And I would like to recall you, would re, uh, you will remember that in October 2020, when we were celebrating the 10 years of Nagoya Protocol, and none other than the Executive Secretary of the CBD, in her opening remarks, she said that ABS is a baby. This baby has to be held in hands for some more time. We need to nurture this baby. And I would like to repeat the same remarks that we need to go a long way in making the ABS a reality. So there will be issues which we need to deal with. And I must again compliment you and your project that we have been able to build certain capacity. We have been to build some learning resources. And this book today will also go a long way because people want to see that what can I refer? And unfortunately, unlike physics and chemistry, there are no textbooks in biological diversity. So this document of yours will go a long way in serving as a learning resource uh, for all those who want to understand what are good examples, where ABS has worked, what kind of challenges are there, and we need to hear the viewpoints of uh, everyone concerned. So I'll stop here, but I would definitely say it is something which needs more attention from all of us. Back to you, Alejandro. 
fully fully agree with you and and you have seen the video that we started uh, this uh, book launch no um that ends saying uh, abs is work in progress no so we very much think that we are still we are starting the path of abs but it's a long path no like sustainable development um and it needs uh, time efforts no we need to invest time and and funds as well there let me as uh, um, I have you on the floor on this, uh, Dr. Uh, Mathur. I'd like to ask a question from a colleague uh, to you regarding how was the benefit, uh, the benefits distributed to the local community, and how did the distribution uh, take into account the conservation of the genetic resources? And I think this connects also with another question that is asking about. Uh, the taxation issue no? that you were indicating in your uh, presentation versus uh, sharing the, the, the profit no? towards the local community and the conservation of the United resources. So well, if, the question is how the benefits uh, are being distributed to the local community and how this distribution takes into account uh, the conservation of the of biodiversity. See, as I said, we have a law. We have an uh, excess and benefit sharing guidelines, which we made in 2014. And in the last seven years, we have been implementing it. While we are implementing it, several issues are coming up. And that is why I said that uh, people uh, interpret it differently. People uh, implement it differently. But what we are trying to say that uh, we sign agreements with the local communities. And in the agreement, it is very clearly mentioned that uh, from where the resource is being collected and there are certain ABS uh, percentages which are fixed, that if the resource is being shared, what part of that resource will go to the community? What part will go for governance purposes? What kind of part will go to the state biodiversity board? So all those percentages are very clearly made, but I would like to highlight the issue now of traceability because the biological resource changes hands. What you see is coming from what we call as a trader, one who trades in that. So see the collector of the resource is someone else, the conserver of a resource is somewhere else, the buyer is somewhere else and the user, the company is something else. So a whole range of uh, value chain is then involved. And that is where when you started discussing the issue of traceability, when you started discussing the issue of blockchain, that is where holds the promise for everyone. Because we need to monitor the movement of the resource from its origin to its end. And that is where we are very eagerly looking forward to this uh, whole issue of blockchain technology, which has proved useful in many other places. But we see that how in biological diversity conservation, how in excess and benefit sharing, it can play an important role. So this is what uh, I would like to say that. And tomorrow we have another uh, event, which uh, is part of this project, where we will be looking at how a big uh, management company with a very important tool, which we call as the information technology tool, can be used in helping us finding out how the biological resource has traversed through its journey. And if we are able to do it correctly, then of course, uh, we, everybody will be a gainer. So I'll stop here, give it back to you, Alandro. I was just showing the, the event that you were, you were making reference uh, to that will take place uh, tomorrow. Um, this uh, webinar, Can Blockchain Improve Traceability of ABS? where we will be presenting the design of a pilot project uh, to test blockchain technology on ABS. No? Um, 
and yes, the idea is to, to move forward with different tools as well. No? Um, legal mechanisms are uh, necessary, but uh, we need also in a field of biotechnology, we need to move uh, and use uh, and rely on technology as well. No? So yes, tomorrow we will see the details and also the, the challenges no? that uh, that uh, pilot project may, may have. And uh, we invite all the colleagues uh, to, to join uh, that event tomorrow. Um, I know, I, let me, uh, uh, have you encountered uh, examples where access to internet sources has led to commercialized products with intellectual property rights, then leading to benefits, benefit sharing or benefits being shared with the communities, countries of origin? Is this taking place already, Dr. Mathur? Yeah, surely there are many examples where uh, commercialization has taken place. Uh, I first quote from my own city of Chennai in Tamil Nadu in southern India, where there is a local community which has the ability to extract uh, the snake venom. And this venom is very, very important. It's a lifesaver and uh, four species of poisonous uh, snakes are involved. And this community has been traditionally uh, using and has the ability to handle the snake, take out the venom. So what we did, our state biological board of the province, it entered into an agreement with a company which wanted uh, the venom to be converted into uh, different products for marketing. And uh, we then entered uh, uh, the community people we brought them together and uh, for every uh, venom supply which the community makes, they get certain percentage of benefit coming out of that. So they, they need to do two things, that their benefits can only happen if the snake remains in the wild. If the snake disappears in the wild, then nobody benefits. So they take care that uh, harvesting of a resource, harvesting of uh, the venom takes place in a systematic manner and uh, it is not illegally and over harvested. And uh, uh, a good mechanism has been set up which ultimately provides a win-win situation to everyone. So the community gets benefit, the industry gets its product. We as regulator are able to ensure that uh, the supply chains are even without the blockchain. In this particular case, because the operations are small and because uh, a local community is involved, not everybody can take and handle snakes. But for other biological resource, traceability will remain an issue. So this is what we are saying that uh, uh, if you conserve the resource, you can get benefit out of that. The industry can get its own product and everybody down the supply chain gets benefit. So yes, there are examples, there may be few, but they are now coming up and we are trying to explain to everyone that it is in everybody's interest to come. Back to you. Exactly, and that, that is one of the challenges, no? Just so we have uh, some nice cases of benefit sharing, but they are still exceptional, no? Uh, and what we want is to uh, make uh, ABS a rule rather than the exception. No? So that's also a key message. Colleagues, uh, final remarks. Um, let me start from the end in this case. Uh, Mr. Uh, Colombi, can you uh, give us any final message or final remarks that you want to convey to the, to the audience? Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, I think from my side, uh, just to also add on what I said earlier on, um, one of the aspects I forgot to mention is that um, <clears throat> one of the challenges is to keep the national ABS regulatory system relevant to the ever-changing or dynamic and evolving ABS environment, especially considering the rapid technological advancement in biotechnology, 
where access to genetic resources takes a form of genetic sequence data. So these are some of the areas which we will have to evolve with time and, and do, do that with speed. But as a country, uh, South Africa, we also have um, decided as a, as a nation um, to work out a strategy that will uh, ensure that we beneficiate our resources because for quite some time, we were exporting majority of our resources as raw material. And therefore we have adopted the, what we call the localization uh, of the, 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 the value chain. So that on the one hand, we are able to have some of these communities rising up, able to develop a product out of these genetic resources and be able to exchange it at a, at a global level as, as a finished product. Uh, I mean, the classical example we have, the communities in the Western and the Northern Cape provinces where these rooibos come from, they've got their own plant, which they are now processing the rooibos. In addition to the, the wonderful work that our industry is doing, so that we are able to, to see uh, the innovation chasm amongst the population, but also technology and skills uh, being embedded amongst community members, amongst entrepreneurs, and that spirit of entrepreneurship. So, so and lastly, I think it may be important to also mention a program director, that as part of this program, to date, we have uh, approved as government over 205 uh, agreements, uh, of which 73 are between communities and the industry. So we've got a range of, uh, of, of, of efforts that we are putting to make sure that as a country, we are in a position to, to beneficiate the indigenous resources, but at the same time, we've got a, an opportunity to export uh, some of the products. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Matibe, for those uh, concluding remarks, which are uh, extremely important. Uh, Dr. Mustafa, do you want to add uh, something, final thoughts? Mustafa, do you want to share any final thought? Uh, thank you, uh, Alejandro, and thank you uh, very much to all uh, my colleagues, the panelists and the participants. Uh, I, I want to, to add uh, uh, that uh, this, uh, the ABS uh, protocol, um, I like the, the, the description of that, this is a paper, and uh, this is something which is uh, um, we, we will, uh, you know, achieve and, you know, make it more ma ma mature and understandable for the whole body of this, uh, this uh, process, um, uh, process and we should uh, have uh, the dedication and, uh, you know, uh, getting, you know, the support to achieve this. Uh, uh, the most important, in my opinion, is the reviewing and updating this process, which is through the implementation, many things will come up and uh, we should be able, you know, to recognize and to adopt and modify our legislation according to. Thank you. Thank you very much for those final thoughts. Dr. Mathur, any final thought that you want to share with the audience? Well, I would say that you and your project has brought us together. It has been a great learning experience. Lots of knowledge products have been developed, but uh, our journey in ABS is very long. 
And as I said, we are only 10 year old. We need to do a lot more hand holding. We need to learn from each other. It could be South South learning. It could be North South learning. It could be any learning, but definitely uh, the issue of access and benefit sharing will remain very, very important for all countries and especially for the 17 mega diverse country of which India is a part because we have uh, this huge resource and we have uh, huge populations as well and we need to demonstrate that uh, access and benefit sharing is the tool which can help our communities to earn their livelihoods and our uh, industry to understand that uh, their pharmaceutical products can only come to the market if they believe and practice in excess and benefit sharing. If they don't want to do that, then our laws are very strict. Then uh, we will get after them uh, one way or the other. But it is in everybody's interest that we cooperate, we bring together our resources, and uh, we understand that the only way in which you can conserve a resource, you can create a livelihood is through the very important mechanism of access and benefit sharing. So I would like and request you, which I have already done many times, that <laughs> we want uh, this partnership to continue. We want uh, this project to grow further and to uh, learn more from each other's experience. So thank you very much once again. Thank you, Dr. Mathur, and I fully agree with you. I mean, uh, we we should continue together, uh, walk in this path. No, otherwise, this is not going to to happen. No? Only if all countries are united with a common vision on on what ABS uh, needs to 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 be and how it needs to be implemented, is going to be very difficult. No? to make this as a central tool for sustainable development, no? as we mentioned during the the presentation and is clearly developed in the book now. Santiago, final thought from your side. <laughs> Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, perhaps a, a final thought is, is related to the, the question of one of the participants regarding examples of, of benefits uh, flowing to the communities. And, uh, and I would like to refer the participant that formulated this question and all other participants to look at the examples that we published, uh, not only in the book that we launched uh, over two, three years ago, uh, titled, you know, uh, ABS is Genetic Resources for Sustainable Development, but also to look at the examples of this book that we're launching today. There are several examples of uh, benefits, monetary and non-monetary benefits being shared with local communities. But again, I would like to insist, this is only possible if we engage the business sector, if government agencies start engaging these different industries and learning about the business models of the industries. We need to start seeing the business sector as a partner because they have the resources, they have the financial resources. We can indeed, Continue, you know, this partnership with all countries to strengthen national access and, and benefit sharing laws and policies, and and to provide, you know, capacity so that they are implemented. But unless we engage the business sector, we're not going to see those benefits flowing back to the communities. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you so much to all the panelists. A big uh, round of applause to all of you. Thank you so much. And also to the ones that were not able to be present with us, but sent us, were kind enough to send us a recorded message. Um, before um, we close this event, I would like to uh, take two minutes uh, to lead you um, to the last pages of the book. And you will find uh, first a chapter dedicated to the global ABS community, which, by the way, will continue in operation in the coming months. And right at the end, we have dedicated the book and pay tribute to the colleagues that left us during the implementation of the global ABS project. And in particular, uh, 
um, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Here, we would like to mention as examples, three colleagues. First of all, Nishama Meki, who worked at UNDP Sudan and supported the coordination of the project at the national level and passed away in June, 2020. Secondly, Ms. Marle Aguilar, who was the ABS National Focal Point in Honduras and the coordinator of the project from the general direction of biodiversity and who tragically passed away in March, 2021. The COVID-19 pandemic has taken, us, has taken from us in a premature and unfair way, many relatives, friends and colleagues. We want to thank them for their committed work and we promise to continue working hard and honor the important legacies that they brought to all of us. I would like also to pay tribute to Ms. Soy Di Carpio, who was a young uh, UNB, United Nations volunteer, supporting communities, sorry, supporting communications of the project in Dominican Republic, and who sadly uh, passed away at the beginning of this year. The incoming publication is dedicated to all of them that left us during the implementation of the project. And I invite you to read the testimony of Soidi's experience under the project, because it is not only an inspiration, but a reference of how we should feel about our work and how we should perform every day. In particular, the ones that we are working in international organizations. Uh, now, to conclude, I would like to thank you for your interest um, in this event. We really hope that you uh, enjoy the book as much as we do. More importantly, thank you to all the colleagues who made possible uh, this book. We have a long list of authors, which uh, shows that this has clearly been a collective effort. No? Uh, let me also thank uh, the team at the Global EBS Project who made this uh, possible. First of all, uh, for Santiago Carrizosa, Santiago's determination and leadership to elaborate and launch this publication uh, as an important knowledge product and a legacy of the project. No? To Patrick McGuire, who coordinated the entire publication. Without uh, Patrick, this uh, development would not have been uh, never taken place. Um, he has been keeping an eye and, and keeping everything under control, um, uh, taking care of the numerous big and small details that are part of these kind of uh, uh, um, big projects and big publications, and always putting pressure on us, on all of us, in a gentle and very professional way to deliver. To the colleagues from InDesign in South Africa, uh, led by Julie Farquhar, for providing us another fantastic design publication to Alvaro Hoyos for offering a beautiful and original cover page. And as I mentioned before, to all the uh, members of the Global ABS team, Petra, Jose, Agustina, Fernando, Claudia, Handan, for their uh, invaluable support. The Global ABS project is coming to an end, uh, but UNDP with the remaining uh, funding of the project is searching for its continuation under a second phase. Um, for that reason, uh, tomorrow we initiate, um, we initiate, sorry, we initiate um, we initiate a kind of transition, uh, a transition stage, uh, transition phase, where the global ABS community will continue in operation, uh, providing support to countries and ABS stakeholders, and preparing a second phase of the project, also with all interested countries and stakeholders. Therefore, please stay tuned as the project is going to organize regional meetings to hear the most important needs that should be addressed and actions that should be taken under this second phase. We will search not only for your support, but also if you are a donor to, uh, to directly invest no, um, 
And if you have an interest on this topic and you have seen the results of this project, don't be uh, shy uh, and we encourage you to, to contact us in order to initiate as soon as possible uh, that uh, discussion. ABS, as we highlighted several times during this event, is work in progress and the global ABS team wants to keep accompanying countries in that uh, determined progress to make ABS the rule and not the exception. Thank you very much, colleagues. Um, thank you for being with us uh, for this book launch. A big round of applause to all of you. And we hope that you can join us also tomorrow. We know we are putting a lot of pressure on different colleagues this week, but it's going to be an interesting uh, presentation on the pilot project to test uh, blockchain technology on Navius. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.